Hi, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful day. Um, welcome to Story Forward Presents. Um, we, uh, we do monthly or bi-monthly events here at Adorama. Um, you know, they are very gracious hosts, uh, and uh, we've been doing some events here. For those of you who are new, we've been doing events here for the uh, past year and a half. And uh, today we are going to be doing the business of storytelling uh, with uh, Steele Filipek, who is the lead transmedia producer at Starlight Runner Entertainment. Um, for those of you who are new, thank you for coming. Um, please be sure to uh, sign in and leave us your email address. We have a monthly newsletter that we send out. Um, we have a lot of really great events coming up, not only for us, but with our partners, um, conferences, workshops, great plays, and you know, st all kinds of storytelling events. Um, so if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to stop by and, and chat with us. And without further ado, I will leave it to Steele. Hey everybody, thank you so much for coming out today. Um, to begin with, the business of collaborative storytelling. Um, I'm going to be talking about the business aspect of it. You guys are all uh, aspiring or established artists. I'm not going to be telling you too much about the structure of storytelling. I assume that you have a grasp on that kind of basic structure. But when I say business, when it comes to collaborative storytelling, it, it's not so much a business in the sense that you're selling things. It's not so much that you're making money. You're engaging in conversation with people. You are creating story worlds together. You're creating something more than the traditional stories that uh, would be existing on traditional broadcast platforms. So a little bit about me. First of all, um, I'm the executive editor and lead transmedia producer at Starlight Runner Entertainment. We're one of the largest and most successful transmedia production companies in North America. We work uh, by extending uh, transmedia, by extending media uh, stories onto multiple media platforms. Um, we've done this for companies like Microsoft, Coca-Cola, Pepperidge Farm, Reebok. We've also worked in story worlds created by Nickelodeon, Sony Pictures, and we've even gone into politics and socio-political platforms, the government of Colombia. Uh, we've worked with universities across the world. Um, and what we found is in this structure of collaborative storytelling that there is the same basic structure that works across the board, no matter whether you're doing crowdsourced campaigns or multimedia advertising rollouts or social awareness, population activation, social media narratives, improv, role-playing, micro-narrative sharing. These all kind of function on the same basic structure. Uh, and it works because people want to hear stories. They want to share stories with one another. The slogan for Starlight Runner Entertainment is that the shortest distance between two people is a story. When you speak to people, when you analogize, you're creating less of a distance. You're shortening that distance between two people. And in the business of collaborative storytelling, you're putting this onto platforms that can help you share that story, help you monetize that, but also help you reach out and touch somebody in a way that traditional platforms um, don't necessarily do in the same fashion. I'm going to start with this quote uh, that Al Gore quoted as an African proverb. Uh, there are two parts to this. Uh, the, the quote is, if you want to go fast, go alone, and if you want to go far, go together. And I say African proverb because uh, no matter how much research I and many other people have done, no one can find where this quote came from. Uh, as a rule of thumb, if a proverb is ascribed to an entire continent, it's probably fictitious. So, but the, the quote itself is fairly true. If you want to go fast, if you want to create a story that speaks to you as a creator, then that's, by all means, grab the bull by the horns and go for it. But if you want to create something long-lasting, something meaningful, meaningful that can reach a lot of people, please do reach out and see how they can share your story with you. We're going to start by looking at case studies involving uh, crowdsourcing. Crowdrise, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, Patreon, even GoFundMe. These basic kind of ways of going out and reaching to people and getting them to fund your activities, to fund your, um, to fund your products, to fund your charity. Um, pe some people think that they're marketing. Some people think that they're a way of raising money. And both of those are true. But if you look at them, what you're really asking for is people to collaborate with you people to tell you what they need, people to give you money or give you support, and for you to give them a product in return, to give them a service in return, to tell them a story in return. So how does that start? 
it's a group venture. Um, you need to pre prepare your project. Um, way too many times people go into these collaborative ventures where they're expecting to just, you know, I'm going to start a Kickstarter. I'm going to raise a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars. And but but how? What do you mean? You need to have your FAQs ready. You need to have forums ready, surveys, disputes. These are mechanisms by which people can talk to you, can figure out answers to your story. These are the first building blocks before you even begin to think about, well, what are my, what are my goals and what are my, what are my rewards? Well, how am I going to get people involved? How are people going to talk to you? How are people going to engage with you? Because if something goes wrong down the line, you're going to need to have a way to speak with them and build their narrative into your narrative. Uh, the second bit is preparing your agents. And by agents, I mean people who are going to go out and proselytize. Indiegogo recommends that 20 to 30% of your backing come from friends and family, and it should come within the first 24 or 48 hours. You can kind of see at the bottom of this slide that the vast majority of these um, Kickstarter or crowdsource campaigns work on a U curve. A vast majority of the content and funding comes in the very beginning, the first 72 hours, and it kind of dies down, and then by the end, it builds back up again as people realize that, hey, something might be happening here. I want to get involved. People want to get involved in a successful campaign. People want to find a product. People don't want to kickstart. People want to get involved that they feel, eh, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to work out. If you can build those building blocks into it first, have that broad support from the beginning, and maybe you know, save a few friends at the end so that if you're 99% of the way there, you can push it a little bit further, that works great. You know, think about also the collaborators. A big part of kickstarting, a big part of crowdsourcing is leveraging people's social media networks. Who are you collaborating with? You're not just working on your own. Look to your production designers, your artists, even the people who are funding your campaign. What can they bring to your campaign? How can you leverage them? How can you get them involved in the process? Third, prepare your audience. Emails, listings, demographics, apps. Uh, if you're, you know, people are thinking once again that this is marketing. If you're marketing in the wrong areas, you're not going to reach the right audiences. Make sure you've got Mailchimp or some other kind of mass, uh, you know, mass emailing service ready to go that can reach out. If you can create story tags, ways that you can tag specific parts of your audience, either you know, hyper-involved um, funders or people who are just casually watching, F figure out ways to get them, you know attached in different points. And finally, prepare your expectations. Pre-fund, pre-design, and pre-fail. Uh, pre-fail is the most important part of this. Everybody wants their Kickstarter, everybody wants their collaborative storytelling piece to be this massive success, but what happens if it only reaches 50%? How can you build off of that 50%? How can you maintain momentum if things don't go quite the way you expected them. You have to kind of prepare for a little bit of that failure. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. If you have all four of those bits in line, you'll be in a much, much better position to succeed with this kickstart, with this crowdsource, with this Patreon, than you would if you just kind of go in expecting, oh, everything's good. everybody's doing Patreon, so that means I should do it too. Know how it works. Uh, a big part of this is having a defined goal. Uh, smart is the system that a lot of people use for defining goals, that it's specific, it's measurable, it's achievable, it's realistic, it's timely. Specific meaning you're not trying to change the world. Everybody wants to change the world. How is your collaborative storytelling device, how is your crowdsource going to actually take specific steps towards achieving something? Measurable, what are the milestones that you need to achieve? Think about your favorite, if, if anybody has kickstarted something before, how there are reach goals, how there are specific points beyond just achieving that one specific thing that's going to give you a video game or give you a, a 3D printer in, at the home or you know whatever it might be. There are measurable achievements that allow you to create milestones as you go along. It's achievable. Going back to that specific part, it's something that you can realistically achieve with the funding that you have. Um, I like to tell people that to look at the mark that you want to get for the funding, increase it by 10% and then decrease it by 20%. Look to see which one of those is the most realistic in what you're going to achieve. Don't expect that you're going to fund your film 100% of the way with Kickstart, particularly because you're going to have to pay taxes you're going to have to pay for a lawyer. 
You're going to have to give things back to your collaborators, your funders. Think about what's achievable in the short term. Think about how you can raise money elsewhere and use the platform as a way to engage in conversation with your uh, funders. Realistic, something that you can realistically achieve and send out on time and timely. Finally, that last bit, a schedule that makes sense for you and for the collaborators. Uh, there is a correlation between the amount of information you give to your funders and the success. That doesn't mean that you send out 100 emails and that means your campaign is going to succeed, but it does mean that the campaigns that do succeed do reach out to their fans on a timely basis. It, it, it makes people feel like they are being involved, that they are being asked for their input, even if 90% of the audience uh, doesn't read those emails that go out. Um, that's around the number that people get. You send out a mass email, only 10% or so activates. But people still feel like they're being validated because they are receiving emails. And then you can break that down into different steps that you might have. Local, regional, and national. How do you go from a local goal to a regional goal to a national goal? How do you go from funding to release to sequel? From the concrete goals to aspirations to ideals? If you're raising money for a charity, how do those concrete goals of funding yourself for a marathon speak to your aspirations for something greater and speak to the ideals that everybody else wants? If you're in you know, the March of Dimes, you know, breast cancer awareness, you know, awareness campaigns are great, but that's the top level. How are you making those concrete goals that are going to speak to people and get them to contribute to you on a defined basis? Uh, the next part is turning obstacles into opportunities. Uh, this comes from Kickstarter itself. Uh, the success rate for Kickstarter is around 35 to 36 percent. People think that you just put it up there and it gets you know, funded or, well, you know, some people, yeah, they didn't really think it through, but I'm going to think it through and get, uh, have a runaway success. That's not always the case. Uh, it's, in fact, not the majority of the case. Most of the time, people are, you know, reticent about giving their money to strangers. They've all heard all of the horror stories. Think about how you, know, you eat an elephant, as the old story goes, one bite at a time. How are you reaching out and creating those small bits to create small bits of success so that when people look back, they can say, oh, there's a landmark of our success. There's a milepost in the future. We're taking small and concrete steps into the future and achieving these small bits. And then at the very end, you've eaten the elephant. The story I have there in the middle is Who's Bad Enough? That comes from a possibly apocryphal story from Bear Bryant, coach of Alabama. He supposedly came into the locker room at halftime down by two touchdowns. His team was dejected, and he just lit into his team, yelling at them, essentially, like, who's man enough, who's bad enough to get out there and change things? We don't need to win the game. We need a touchdown. Let's get to one touchdown, and that'll get us back to within another touchdown. Let's take one step and get there and the team you know didn't quite respond and so he essentially said all right i'm going to take the first 11 players who get out onto that field and they're going to go out into the field let's see who's bad enough to get out there and try and get us that touchdown and a bunch of people got up and they kind of lazily went to the door and he said no 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 no, no. That's, that's not how this works go back and sit down i want to see the 11 bad enough men to come and you know take this touchdown let's go see it and supposedly what happened then is that everybody in the team tried to rush at the door at the same time and they got into a gigantic brawl and eventually 11 bloodied men charged out onto the field and they scored three touchdowns in four minutes. So, possibly an apocryphal story. I can't find the source of that. But that kind of speaks to understanding your audience, turning those obstacles into opportunities. You're down a little bit. Who are your, among your storytellers, among your collaborators, among your funders are going to be the people who are going to push you over the edge, who are going to find and get you to that next landmark, get you to that next milepost. You need to turn those people into individuals. Understand what they need from your story. It's not just the product. They have some kind of inner need that you're going to fulfill. There's the phrase from Thomas Jefferson that one person with courage makes a majority. If you can make that person feel like they are contributing, that they are producing not just a goal for you, but a goal for them, then they will be attached for life. Think about all the brands that you're so closely affiliated with. 
be you an Apple person or you only fly JetBlue? What was that one experience that made you sit down and think, you know, I, this, is, this is great. Typically it's customer service. Typically there's some moment where someone has reached out to you and made the efforts to make you feel like you're a person, an individual, someone who has had something happen to them and they're going to correct it. You are connected with that story. You're connected with your backers. You are giving them points at which they can attach themselves and feel lifted with the crowd. You've talked, we've listened. This is, a, uh, this is a function that almost all media and marketing campaigns do. There have been, there's been a lot of chatter about this and we didn't agree with it at first, but now we are listening to you. We realize we have messed up and we are going to do something about that. That works for gigantic you know, campaigns. It also works on smaller campaigns because you have the power to speak to individuals. You have the power to kind of you know, nicheify, if, if that's a word, your audience and to speak to those individual groups. And if there are people who are super users, you can get them to you know, work a little bit more for your team. Uh, you can give them additional content. You can give them assets. Give them the little extra that makes them feel like they're a part of something more. And then they will go and share with all of their friends. They're doing your work for you. Turning micro-narratives into media data. This was something that I am Malala uh, and Support Malala uh, did very well. Obviously, there was the book. There was the uh, social media campaign. And what, they, um, what the producers did with National Geographic was that they encouraged people to videotape themselves and to upload onto their own channels and onto a centralized website their own stories of how they overcame adversity, which then became a separate platform and a separate story altogether. They were asking people to take part and show and share their stories and thus were becoming just like Malala, maybe not as powerful of a story or as wide spanning or someone with a three book deal and a, you know, a movie deal, but someone who had a story that was willing to be told, someone who had something that people wanted to hear. And because it was validated on these gigantic platforms, it went out to thousands and thousands of people. Rewarding, validating, and celebrating. What is the reward for you? The reward for you is getting your product, your speech, your piece out there. But what is it for them? What is it beyond just the product that they're getting? What is it the thing that they're getting now when they're giving their money and they don't have something, they're expecting something in the future? What is it that they're going to get? Is it being a part of a group? Is it being a part of this forum? Maybe it's something like they get extra perks. Maybe it's just that they get to talk to you as a creator and help collaborate and create something. Remember that tangible results as in actual physical products they're stronger because they're a physical reminder of things that have happened in the past, but they're also more expensive. A big problem that crowdsourcing and kickstarting campaigns have is that they promise too many tangible results, and in the end, they wind up losing a lot of money because they actually have to produce the things and market the things and ship them out, whereas digital results, they're ephemeral and they're less expensive. You don't necessarily see them. They don't necessarily cre create the same kind of emotional binding that a physical product does but they do have a tangible result that you can give to people in the short term. Once you fund this, once you put your money in, we're going to give you all this content, this free digital content that we've already created because we're creating a game. The Banner Saga is a case study I'll go, go into in a second. But it also speaks to what's happening in the future. See all this content that we're seeding to you? These are essentially trailers. These are essentially previews of what the content is to come. It gets you excited and it allows those people to share that content online. These small reminders help your audience recognize, remember, and continue to grow. They want to share. They want to be involved in this storyline. They want to see where it goes. The Banner Saga, as I just spoke to, was a kick-started video game campaign. The best way to describe it uh, is that it would be Game of Thrones meets Oregon Trail. Uh, that, and that sounds you know, kind of humorous, but you go along and you're building up your crew and you're facing off against poison and danger and you're making choices in a story world that eventually see you through an entire trilogy. The uh, creators for the Banner Saga, I believe it was Stoic Games, they pitched it as a trilogy, but they made sure that each individual segment told a complete story and that every time you funded something, and not only, they didn't always just give you content such as actual banners that spoke to your own family's history or the ability to create emblems that could be used in the game itself that went out to hundreds of thousands of people. 
They also built into the structure ways so that they could send you free trailers and free content to bridge the gap because there's a two or three year uh, turnaround time for each of these titles. The Banner Saga, Banner Saga 3 is supposed to come out next year and they've been slowly building and, and building their audience to the point where the final act of this trilogy will culminate uh, with the storyline that you as creators and you as audience members and you as viewers have worked on not just in story but in the meta textual story as well. Uh, this kind of came, uh, putting it all together, kind of bringing it into a much smaller but more uh, easily identifiable package uh, beyond the queer sci-fi sci and fantasy anthology was a kickstarted campaign uh, that focused on science fiction and fantasy story from a, an LGBTQ uh, perspective. It was funded um, within, I believe, two weeks of its, um, of its beginning. And what they had done was they'd leveraged all of these collaborators. They'd gotten a bunch of people together who had you know, a sizable social media uh, footprints between all of them. They got them to reach out on all their platforms and at specific times trigger so that people would come in and fund and push this uh, product up and over the mark and then create, created reach goals so that at each point there were additional artists beyond who could contribute to that overall story. So it wasn't just that this is a, a static piece of storytelling. This is a story, who wants this one artist involved? Well, if you want this one artist involved, let's see if we can reach that goal. Let's see if we can create something more than just what we're expecting. Let's see what you guys want out of this anthology. They went into forums, they took people's advice, they made sure that the print quality was of a certain kind, that they were reaching out to markets that might not have necessarily heard it, and they built it so that it had a flow so that it went from this one release, this one, I should say, funding, through to release, and now they're producing a sequel uh, that uh, was just kickstarted and is set to be released in January or February next year, focusing on the digital rewards because it's easier to fund those, but also having a substantial physical reward campaign as well. This quote from Dwight Eisenhower is particularly important for collaborative storytelling. In World War II, after World War II, he had the quote that plans are worthless, but planning is essential. That once you hit the ground, once you actually have people talking, the plans that you've made are kind of worthless because it's a chaotic system. You have no idea which way it's going to go. But if you plan for these eventualities, you will know how to react given certain situations as they arise. Uh, if you have 10,000 collaborators, 10,000 storytellers, you know, trying to create something together, it's almost impossible to tell where the story is going to take you in the audience. But if you have best and worst case scenarios and a few other you know, markers on the spectra, you can kind of finagle that and push and pull audiences through a structure that feels cohesive and compelling. This is particularly important when you're dealing with post-based structures. From as basic as Twitter, 140 characters, obviously with Twit longer and you can get a little bit longer, through to Wikipedia, Stitcher, which in this case is a placeholder for all pocket uh, podcatchers, YouTube. They all function on this idea that you are posting things in sequence, you are building up an audience, and that in some way your audience can speak back to you. Uh, in Twitter, it's literally they're adding you or they're hashtagging or they're trying to you know, speak in contact with you. Uh, with YouTube, there is the comment sections. With Tumblr, you're, re, uh, you're, you're hosting and you're retweeting, or retweeting, you're sharing, and you're building off of the narrative that everybody is creating all the way up to Wikipedia, as I said, where you're having thousands upon thousands of collaborators coming in together and telling a story, uh, hopefully a nonfiction story. Um, but obviously there are mechanisms that they put into place to structure that so that the best gatekeepers are kind of maintaining control so you don't have a bunch of trolls coming in and creating graffiti. Uh, the basic post structure, these are all rules of thumb that I'm going to get into. Uh, obviously you can break them, but it's a good idea to understand the, the basics of it. The rule of three, there is a link, commentary, and a flow tag. Flow tag meaning your uh, hashtag or you're tweeting at somebody. A link, something from the past, something that gives context to what you're about to say. Commentary, something that you're saying about that particular piece. And then a flow tag, pushing people out. It has a nice flow to it. You come in, you comment, you move on. It feels like there's something happening. You're getting people to take action. Rather than just 
listening to you, they're, they're in constant motion. They're thinking about things, they're coming in, they're going someplace, and then they're moving on elsewhere to see what else and what other people are talking about. If you're doing it right, your, these short form, these tweets that you're doing, these very basic Facebook posts, they're very, they're very much like fast takes. They're emotional, they're by the guts. You're not expected to do a lot of analysis based on this because you're making a joke or you're commenting or you're just responding to someone in real time. And those have power because we all have emotional reactions, um, but you need to understand that obviously with that comes some kind of responsibility, this understanding that maybe this fast take might not be better in the long term, which is why you have essays. You have these longer pieces like a YouTube clip or a, Word, um, a WordPress uh, post, something that is designed to create discussion, something where you have a comment section, someone where, somewhere where you are having emails and your uh, email structures where you're reaching out to people and they're reaching out to you to create more discussion and share content. Uh, Tumblr works in a very similar way. And then you have long form, which is long-term analysis, and the pieces like would, that would be on Vox or Vice Media, things that you not, not necessarily want discussion where you have a specific viewpoint that you want to share with people and you want them to share likewise. At the bottom here, you have the number of characters in a post. Uh, this comes from Facebook. The shorter the number of characters you have in a post, the more likely people are going to you know, react to it in a very instantaneous way. But the more characters you have in a post, the more likely they are to engage and take action based on that. The longer something is, the more likely someone's going to get in depth with it, the less likely they will be to you know, click on it, watch it or read it. How often have you clicked a GIF or a photo or a quick video that someone has sent to you because it's so quick, it's easily digestible. How many times do you watch a full video that someone sends to you that's six or seven minutes long? If you trust the person, absolutely. If it's just coming out of the ether, maybe, maybe not. But when you watch something that's so impressive, you, you share it with all your friends, you have to see this. This is so amazing, this is so great. Conflict creates clicks. When you're creating something, you want to create that discussion point, something that gives your point of view. But be wary, obviously recognize that the more conflict you create, the more, the na more naturally you're going to bring people out who are going to discuss with you. Uh, who, might necessarily, who might not necessarily want to engage in conversation. They might just want to derail it. So just be aware of that as you post. Directional structure, a string of posts in a row. Um, I, I can't tell you how many creators I talk to who don't involve, get involved in the community that they are wishing to be involved with. They don't go to the forums. They don't go to these sites. They don't discuss with people on Twitter or Facebook. You don't have to do it all. but. The more you're engaged in the community, the more likely you are to be able to know where things are becoming kind of you know, prosaic, cliche. The more you're going to be able to find new creators who have new voices and new takes. And the more you're going to be able to find a niche for yourself. So retweet, follow, comment, build up that creative cachet so that you're viewed as you know, a speaker in the field. Second most important point is create a regular schedule and stick with it. This is particularly important when you are starting off when you are reaching out to people for the first time. How are they going to know that you are respectable enough that they can come to you and trust your opinion and engage with you in conversation if you aren't creating content on a regular schedule? It doesn't matter how regular this is, it can be once a month, so long as it's on Friday at noon, the first Friday of every month. It could be the, the, every Tuesday. It can be Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays. It doesn't matter what it is, so long as you hit it and you keep with it. Create that cachet up front so that you have a lead time, so you have a little bit of ebb and flow. You don't have to constantly be creating content. Create that regular structure so that people know that they can come to you for that and you know, they, can, they can find something for it. Think about a television show. How, how annoying would it be if Game of Thrones was on at random times, at 8.37 on a Tuesday, or noon on a Sunday, or two o'clock in the morning on a Friday? There'd be no real structure. Yeah, you could push it, but there's a reason that that structure has maintained since the days of radio. People know when to go and where to go for their content, and then they go and they get it, and then afterwards they talk about it. Uh, the image here is the usage of device based on day. This is obviously averaged out. There's a rule of thumb. In the mornings and in the late evenings, people are commuting. They're more likely to be on their mobile phone or on their tablets. Uh, it means that they're going to be commuting, they're going to be listening to content that's going to be engaging with them. 
um, that you know, is going to spark their imaginations. When they're in the middle of the day, they're at work, they're not necessarily able to have that concrete uh, focus. They're just getting bite-sized information. They're quickly glancing at Facebook or they're going to Reddit. They're getting a little bit and then they have to get back to work. So kind of think about that as you structure your rollouts too. If you're creating something that requires in-depth analysis, consider you're releasing posts in the morning or at late night so that people can you know, pick it up as they go to work or as they're coming home from work. Uh, also with mobile and tablet devices, notice that blip at the very end of the day when people are just about to go to bed. They're watching a little bit of content, they're eating a little bit, they're just relaxing. They want something that engages them in a casual sort of way before they hit the hay. Um, the arc structure, the structure for a season, the structure for a long-term story arc. I use the term breathe in, breathe out. As artists, there's the saying that you know, when you breathe out, you're creating, and when you breathe in, you're consuming art and culture. You can't always breathe out, you, otherwise you run out of breath, you run out of things to say. You have to be able to breathe in, you have to be able to take content in and understand where the cultural zeitgeist is going, where, what people are talking about. Take time when you are posting to be able to take a break from your content, from your collaborations, and to go out and just consume or speak with other creators, speak with audiences, or just go out and watch a movie. Find ways that you can engage in life, and that will inspire you to create more. That also goes with your arc structure for your pieces. If you're releasing on uh, every Friday at, say, in the morning, because you're commenting on the politics from the week before, think about how you can push in with advertising and with tweeting and everything on the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, getting people excited and interested in the content you're about to share, and then on Saturday and Sunday, pushing out so that you're commenting on the commentary. You're getting people to retweet that. You're, you're discussing with people. And then maybe laying low on Monday and Tuesday, allowing people to kind of find their other content. Breathe in and breathe out. Create that long form arcing structure so that much like the NFL season, which is starting today, you have all, everything leading up to this moment. There's a climax of activity, and then everybody is discussing it for the week after, which kind of builds off you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then starting Thursday with the next game. Uh, which is typically terrible, but it's positioned that way for a reason because it gets people talking and excited about the games that are going to happen on Sunday. And then you have more on Friday and Saturday until Sunday. There's another climax of culture, and then it kind of comes down again. You have the Monday morning takes and Monday morning quarterbacks and everything. They're, they're talking about it rather than creating the content. Look to that also as actual ways to understand the content from a daily perspective. On the weekdays, you have people who have longer engagements, but it's more casual. You watch TV, you're not really in depth, you're, you're, you know, it's the Big Bang Theory, it's the latest episode of NCIS, it's this content that is casual that you have fun while watching it, and you might tweet about it, but you're, you're not super invested in it. On the weekend, people have a lot less time, so when they're engaged in your artwork and they're engaged in collaboration, they're more intense. They want, they, they want to watch the football game from 1 o'clock to 3.30. They need to be there so they can be it from kickoff to the very end, and then after that, they kind of come down and they go about and they do their, uh, they do their daily chores unless they're too drunk. Um, look to your locale for inspiration. Um, in New York, obviously, you have a lot more people who are commuting on the subway, on public transportation. There's a reason that New York, Chicago, and LA have the highest uh, engagement rates for podcasts because people actually have the ability to listen to podcasts as they're going to and from work. They're just sitting on the subway listening, you know, recapping the day or listening to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, something that engages their mind in a way that is fun and percolating, but not so much that it requires their immediate attention. Whereas, say, in Miami, which is you know, much more of a music and clubbing-based culture, their peak radio um, listenership is 6, 7, 8 p.m., uh, which is typically the, the worst time for radio. Almost everybody listens to radio in the morning, and then they kind of listen to it a little bit in the afternoon as they're driving home, and then that's it, because they're eating dinner, they're you know, playing with their kids. In Miami, people are building up to go out clubbing, they're listening to music, they're getting ready, and so if you have that kind of radio culture down there, understanding that that's a great time to advertise, it's a great time to reach out to people, a great way to engage audiences in a new way. The prime rule for all of these, for flow or current, getting people to engage with you, People are incentivized by goal reward structures. Who excites the audience? Where do they go for fun? What are you giving them? Why should they tune in? How are you validating their participation? 
people want to tune in because they're getting something from you. They want to engage in collaboration because they want to hear from you. They're willing to buy your products because you're giving them something more than just the products. You're engaging with them as an individual. They're giving you something, you're giving them something, and they're giving something to you in return, their attention. If you can incentivize that, if you can give them a path, a goal that they can follow, and a reward, then they're much more likely to tune in because there's a reason for them to tune in beyond just needing to listen to you as a storyteller. Think about how radio uh, programs from the beginning of time have given away concert tickets, have invited people to guest star, have gotten people to listen to their favorite comedians. There's a reason for you to tune in rather than beyond just the music and the funny voices on the radio show in the morning. There's a reason that they want to listen and they have to, there's a tangible goal for that. Uh, Hooked does, has done this very, very well. Who here has heard of Hooked? One person. Of course you would have heard him. Uh, he's a student of mine. So Hooked is an application that tells stories via text and social media. As in you go in and you read stories and they take place via text chains and via Twitter chains and via Facebook chains. Uh, it started about two years ago. It's experienced 17,000% growth, over $10 million in revenue, and 20 million downloads. It is a very unique business structure. If you can finish the story in under six minutes, you don't have to pay for it. Otherwise, you can buy a monthly pass for, I believe, $3.99 or a yearly pass for $39.99, which is building towards allowing you, as the audience, to create content on their platforms as well. When they first launched, they engaged as many creators as possible uh, with multiple business platforms to try and get them to tell stories and leverage their social media networks to be able to invite people on and look at this content. It's very, very new. Not everybody is really enthralled with it, but it's hugely popular with people under the age of 25. Over 69% of their audience is under the age of 65. These are people who use Snapchat and Twitter and Facebook and all these other platforms to tell stories naturally because they've grown up with them. Uh, I didn't grow up with them, so to me it's alien. But obviously there's a lot of growth there. They build that structure so that when young people come in, they get engaged, they want to feel more, they either get one story and it's complete and they want to read more, or they don't finish it and they need to feel more and read more. So they buy it, they become hooked on the story that is being told. They've discovered that horror works very, very well because it works to the imagination. Comedy also works to a degree because it is so ephemeral. Um, but that's just one way that a company has engaged their audience to help do the work for them. Um, when you share that content, you get discounts, you incentivize coming back over and over again. Guiding the process is the most important part once you've gotten all that structure and planning down. Because as a collaborative medium, you're not going to be telling a story so much as guiding that story down the path. You're not expecting people to just you know, listen to you, they're going to want to contribute something to the story world. They're going to want to listen to you and then give it back to you in some kind of capacity. Think about Dungeons and Dragons or improv theater or, you know, folding story, write fold pass. These, some of these are mechanisms by which you can tell an Im improvisational story. Other times they are stories that are mostly planned out, but they have some give and take. There's a reason that a lot of marketing and branding companies are looking to designers of role-playing games as the new form and the new voices of marketing and branding. Because these people are used to thinking on the fly, they're used to coming up with ideas and you know, sharing and getting people involved. Because if, you, if anybody has ever been involved in a role-playing game, you have to listen to the audience. If you just give them as a creator, as the DM, the story you want to tell, they may or may not engage, your players may or may not engage, but it's much better if they, if they find content that they want to do, find the fun that they want to attach themselves to. What is the m most in exciting point that you can give them, and then what are the points that they want as an audience? Build on that. Don't destroy. There's the yes and, which is very important from a organizational perspective. Um, if anybody's been involved in improv, Yes and, you don't stop telling the story, you build off of it, and it goes to places where you're not expecting. It's fun because it's unexpected, it, it builds off of it, uh, and you're not stopping the creative juices, you're getting everybody involved. Think about that when you're involved in a social media narrative, or you're involved in marketing. If you're telling people that no, 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 this isn't the brand, or you're telling people no, 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 this isn't the story, you're stopping them in their tracks. Instead of saying, 
well, that's an interesting aspect. Why don't you go over here and speak with this other group of individuals who are also interested in that aspect? Distant mountains, open spaces, and dynamic contingencies. These are fancy words for allowing the audience to find their own spaces to create content. Distant mountains was a term J.R.R. Tolkien came up with and how he would just create these moments, these kind of landmarks in the distance that characters would refer to that spoke to an ancient history. They created a world that fans would go on to fill in for themselves. Think about how in Calvin and Hobbes there's the noodle incident, there are all the uh, or Hamster Huey and the Gooey Kablooey, these moments that spark audiences' imaginations but are never actually referred to. The audiences to this day, 20 years, 22 years after Calvin and Hobbes was retired, people still talk about what it was like. People have created fan content and created comic books that are Hamster Huey and the Gooey Kablooey and they you know, talk about what the noodle incident was. They want to be engaged. They want to have their imaginations you know, spurred. Open spaces literally meaning where there is just nothing. I haven't thought about it yet, but sure, if you want to create something there, go for it. Uh, this is very popular among uh, RPGs, among you know, big time uh, television shows. We haven't necessarily thought about it yet, but if, you know, if that's what tickles your fancy, sure. Head canon, if anybody has heard of that term where fans create this canon for themselves, sometimes it's so popular that you know, people weave it into the storyline. Um, there is the idea that James Bond is not one character, that he is many individuals who utilize the same name and the same calling card, uh, which is why he always says his name. A spy would never do that. But if he was many individuals taking on that persona, maybe, he, maybe that's you know, a, point that, a point of warning or a point of anonymity out in the open uh, that has been played with and a lot of different uh, platforms. Not all creators buy into that. Sam Mendes specifically wrote it out in Skyfall. But that hasn't stopped fans from picturing the idea of like, well, what was the Sean Connery bond really about? What, what, where, did, where did the Pierce Brosnan bond come from? And finally, dynamic contingencies. This is something that I learned when I was DMing my campaigns in Dungeons and Dragons. You can't create a gigantic world uh, on your own and expect your fans not to try and find ways to break that story, find ways to go off the rails. When you have three doors, that may, might lead to three different paths, one door to the desert, one door to the water world, one door to the, the mountain. You can have the same path designed just in three different skins. You have the same hallway, except in one hallway, there's water all around. The next hallway, there's rock all around. It makes it feel like the audience is participating. Oh, I chose this door. It's really just a reskin content you've had from before. You don't have to create everything. You can create enough and create the illusion of this larger world that fans will then feel, oh, I actually had a, a choice in the matter. Not really, but it feels like it is. And finally, making failure fun. This kind of builds off of yes and. If you've ever been involved in a story, in a campaign, in something where you try to do something and you failed, you have to go back to the end of the line, it's very disheartening. You maybe don't want to engage with it anymore. Maybe, maybe not feel ashamed, you feel it might be embarrassed. Why not make that failure fun? Why not allow that person to laugh with you, to laugh with themselves, and then to allow that story point that they created to build that into the story itself? Make their failure part of the fun of the engagement. Finally, not finally, next, ask questions. Leading, if possible, you want people to give them your ideas. You know, what do you think happens next? I'm thinking that it's a lot like this, but maybe you have some other idea. You're leading them to some possibility, but if they don't take it, that's fine. They can go in some other way. Open-ended. Um, open-ended questions are okay as long as there are not too many of them because if you ask an open-ended question, there is a potential for it to go completely off the rails someplace where you haven't, haven't thought about it. Um, you have enough collaborators, you're going to have someone who wants to break your system. And rarely binary. Binary, yes and no. Um, cr can create a problem because it, it ruins the illusion, even though there is an illusion of two choices. It's either yes or no, it's this or that. You want people to find their individual approach to these stories. You want to find something that reflects them in the stories that you create. It's going to create a lot of brand uh, stalwartness. It's going to make them feel like they're actually engaging and creating the story with you. Whereas if it's just yes or no, well, they, you know, obviously the creator wants me to go one, down one of these two paths. It doesn't feel real doesn't feel like I'm engaging. Keep an e-journal, public, wiki, or private WordPress. Um, 
you know, this is the big thing among fans now that they'll go out and create these wikis that you know chart every moment and every character and every beat from a storyline. I know for a fact that uh, creators that I've worked with in the past go to these sites and mine them for content because they don't remember what's going on in episode 33 of season two. They were dealing with their issues at home and they were teaching on the side and they were juggling three scripts and they were working on all these different things. They don't remember the exact moment where Finn got into trouble, you know, with the Ice King or whatever. I don't know, I don't watch Adventure Time. The point is that allow people to create these wikis, give them spaces where they can create the content for themselves and register it, and then you can go and engage them on those points. Reddit does this very, very well. Always have links and rewards at the ready. If someone has a great idea, if someone has something that's very encouraging, retweet it, share it, you know, spin off of it. Say, well, I haven't thought about it that way. Maybe there is something that I can do uh, along that path. Make sure that they feel that when they go to these spaces, they're not just speaking, spending time with other fans. They're not just curating content. They have the ability to create and craft content with the creators. Don't force it. You have to allow the story to evolve naturally. This goes back to the binary points. If you're just pu pushing a story down one way or the next, you're kind of putting people in the pigeonholes. You have to allow them to have individuality. Some fans will try to break your story. Other fans will try to fix it. Identify those fans early on. Sometimes breaking a story is good. You need to have some point to get out of that you know, same kind of cycle. Other times you don't want that, you have a specific goal you want to go to, make sure that you know where those fans are. Make sure you know who the fans are who are going to fix it, who are the fans who can come up with answers that you might not have thought of, and also understand the fans who are going to try and gatekeep content to the point that they exclude other people. They're making sure the story stays on point. That's never fun. It's good to have super fans who can share content, but you also want fans who are going to be able to you know, engage people and bring them in. We want you to be a fan of this sports team. We want you to be a fan of this uh, movie franchise. We want more people involved. We don't want people you know, saying like, no, 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 you're not a real fan. You weren't there in 1965 when so-and-so happened. You don't know the real story. That's the kind of exclusionary fixing that you want to avoid. And make sure you have the tools for both. When I speak to that, you're not necessarily going to have those tools right away, but look for the content that the fans create. Most people here probably know that the hashtag for Twitter was not created by Twitter's founders. It was a piece of code that fans created that allowed them to search for content very, very easily. If you search for a hashtag with something after it, it comes up pretty quickly. Eventually, after a lot of hemming and hawing, uh, the um, the programmers at Twitter decided, well, people are really using this, let's build it into the code. Now, ha the hashtag is the number one reason why people engage with Twitter. They want to find people who are talking about the same topic of conversation. They want to see what people are saying, they want to respond to it, they want to challenge it. It gives reason to Twitter rather than just speaking your mind 140 characters at a time. Make others look good. The best parties are those that people want to join. You want to have a party, you want to make sure everybody's having a good time, but you have to share that. You're not the sole center of attention. Everybody wants to be you know, the creator that everybody lauds, but you also need to be allowed people to have their own time to shine. You need to validate fans and put them up and reward them. We talked about support Malala before, validating fans, putting them on the face and getting their voices out there. Think about how powerful it is when a hero of yours uh, retweets uh, a tweet that you've made or comments on a Facebook post or mentions a, you know, a book that you've been reading and likes it and you're like, I like that book too. We think we're like, it's perfect. You need to be able to validate that kind of participation, once again, because it is that collaborative process. It's not just about you. You have to celebrate others. You need to allow them to find their bit of control. And if you need to do control, make sure it matches your message. If you need to rein them in a little bit, make sure that you're saying, well, this story is really about inclusion. You know, excluding people kind of runs counter to that message. Isn't it better that we're getting as many people involved? You're telling a story that weaves them back in. You're always collaborating with them. Like, you might be going a little too far astray. I'm not saying it's bad, but maybe think about it in this way. This is what YouTube does with its creators platform. It engages them and makes sure that it fits YouTube's guidelines, which are now becoming narrower and narrower as they're trying to appeal to a broader and broader marketing audience. 
They want people to continue to create content because that's the, the way it's going to make money, but they also need to have a certain set of parameters, at least according to their board, that's going to allow them to become profitable in the next decade or so. They need to guide that path and make sure that everybody is on board. And then they, they, they need to you know, advertise them and push forward, not just the top hitters, um, but also finding those niche creators who might have the potential for a broader audience if they were to find a bigger audience. If you look at the recommendations on your YouTube page, you'll find you know, things that have 10 million views and things that have 5,000 views. And that's an uh, algorithm that YouTube has created to try and create content for you as the individual as well as the creator. And understand your arc. Know where you're heading with the story that you are telling. This is important uh, particularly for sports, but for any kind of campaign that goes via a season. Um, you can't control a sports campaign. You can't predict who is going to win the championship. In fact, most teams, the vast majority, will not win the championship. What happens when your team doesn't win the championship? What happens when you don't reach the goals? How are you going to engage audiences before and after the season and get them to be excited when things have a misstep, when you just miss the playoffs, when you get blown out because you're up 28 to three and you don't run the football and instead you pass the football a lot. You have to create a storyline that's going to reinvest your fans into the story you're telling. When is it time to give your audience and yourself a rest? When is it time to re-engage? Create individualized arcs, focus on individual players, focus on individual creators, focus on individual moments. Um, a big thing that's coming down now is create your own loyalty programs um, where football and baseball teams will say, if you buy a certain amount of tickets or you engage in a certain amount of ways, here are the platforms that we will allow you to create your loyalty uh, program for. Do you want you know, free golf outings? We can work with that. Do you want a box? Sure. Do you want a discount on your tickets? Do you want extra tickets for these premier games? You choose what you want out of these programs and we will give them to you if you reach these certain marks. It individualizes the approach and it creates a natural arc for the person themselves. Most people who are fans of the Cleveland Browns know they're not gonna win 12 games this year, but they also know that they want to go see a few marquee games. And if they can win one or two of those marquee games, then it's a step in the right direction. And it feels like they're taking part in a long-term arc. Get in late, leave early, and let people talk. Allow your fans to do the story for you. A sports team is not just a program, it is a community of fans who come together, wear the emblems on their chest, sorry, and then share that content with like-minded fans. Who is, you know, who is going to replace Ben Roethlisberger after he retires this year? What's going to happen if Sidney Crosby has another concussion? What's going to happen, you might tell where my personal you know, <laughs> uh, favorite sports teams lie. Um, what's going to happen to Steven Stamkos if he gets injured? What's going to happen to the, uh, to the NHL? Because this year they're not, the NHL players aren't going to the Olympics. This creates a narrative that you as you know, creators, if you're involved with a sports team, or involved in some kind of ongoing episodic arc that's kind of out of your control, to mitigate and direct talk. Um, as an example, um, when the Tampa Bay Lightning were bought in the early 2010s, they had a lack of audience engagement. There had been a lot of fights with ownership before that. They'd uh, not been to the playoffs for a few years. There was this idea that it was a sad sack organization that was just kind of spinning its gears. It's in Tampa Bay, not exactly the traditional hockey hotbed. And what the new owners did when they came in, the new, owner, the new principal owner, first of all, um, they did a redesign of the jersey. Like that happened in the past. This is a new era that we're creating. We're not necessarily going to get to the Stanley Cup tomorrow, but this is a new, you know, a new focus. They went out and hired new front office. They uh, drafted new players. It was a complete remodel. And then they gave away uh, jerseys to every season ticket holder. A, so that it showcased, you know, this is the new jersey. People got a free jersey and they wore it around. It's free content that you're giving to them. Not free, but, you know, it's expenditure, marketing. And then they also, put a chip in the sleeve of these jerseys so that they, when they went to uh, food concession stands and the store, they could get uh, discounts. They swiped their sleeves and they got discounts. It gave them, as super fans, a reason to like, say, oh yeah, I get extra content, I get a discount. It reminds them of the strength that their season ticket gives them. It also allows the Lightning to know where their fans are going during the game. What are the hot spots? Where are they most engaging? Where are they not engaging? This 
program is so successful that it began to roll out to the outer lying bars and areas where people could go and swipe their chip and see, you know, and get discounts because these bars and restaurants wanted to engage with people after the game. They wanted to make it so that they would come and spend money there rather than at another bar. And that also allowed them to create partnerships with the Lightning able to, you know, say, hey, we have a lot of fans coming this way. You might want to have a, an autograph session here, or you should know that traffic's going to be very terrible. It creates a longer term narrative that binds people together. This was something we worked with as Starlight Runner down in Western Australia with Curtin University. Uh, they had a, uh, an issue with low retention rates or lower retention rates among low socioeconomic status students and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Uh, the average retention rate among students was 82 to 83 percent. Among ATSI and low SES students, it was 63 percent. There was a massive drop off. Uh, students weren't feeling like they were being engaged on campus. Uh, the campus, and like many campuses in Australia, uh, is not the same kind of campus environment we have in the United States, where you go and you live in a dorm and you go to football games and you create this natural alma mater uh, idea. It was a place where you went to learn, you learned, and then you got out and you went back to your apartment. Only if, uh, I think 5%, 5 to 10% of people actually who go to school in Curtin live on the Curtin campus. So there wasn't that daily reminder that this is your campus, this is you, this is a part of your experience, uh, which made it very particular, maybe a very particular problem for people who already felt that they weren't welcome on campus. They didn't have the money, or they didn't look like people who were on campus. Why should I engage with a campus that doesn't want me here? Uh, and by you know, the reverse, you know, Curtin was trying to reach out to these students, but they didn't understand where these students were going, why they weren't engaging. They had all these social services. Why weren't students engaging with them? And so after doing a long uh, analysis program with Curtin, with the students, we began to create a program, Humans of Curtin, that utilized media off campus and on campus to tell the stories of the students who were engaging with the university. They were telling their stories about where they came from, who they were, what classes they were taking. They were encouraged on certain walls to create graffiti. They were encouraged to you know, create productions on campus to make it feel more like a home. It was a place for people to come and experience rather than just to come and learn. It felt more like a place where people would congregate rather than just come in, get what they needed and get out. And because of that, people began to congregate more and more on campus and there were more and more touch points between faculty and students. There were more opportunities for you know, failing students or students who felt like they were castigated against to meet with somebody who could give them advice, who could point them in the right direction. And because it was personal, there was, there was much deeper than a standard marketing campaign would be. So when the economic recession hit Western Australia, retention rates across the board dropped at Uni uh, Curtin University, with the exception of low SES and ATSI students. They, in fact, increased as students felt more compelled to stick around and tell their story. They felt that through this adversity, they would come together as a university. They t would come together as a student body and create something more than just you know, a standard diploma and e educational experience. As Terry Pratchett said, people think that stories are shared by people but in fact, it's the other way around. People are shared by stories. Our experiences and our lives are shared by the stories that we tell to people. The more power you can give to your collaborators, the more likely they will want to engage you as creators, the more likely they will come to you for their content because they will feel not that they are someone being sold to, they will feel like they are someone being involved in a conversation. And if you can create a story that affects enough people, you can change the world. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a few questions. So, oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Oh. Go for it. <laughs> so now we're going to open it up to Q and A. Um, I have a microphone here to pass around for those who have questions, comments. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> hey, Steele. Hey. Um, so I'm actually curious a little bit more about um, Curtin University. Yeah. If you could talk a little bit more about how you went about um, both analyzing and then also engaging the students. Yeah, so um, I'll take the second part first. Um, 
we actually utilize student stories and student creators and students on the campus to go out and create this content as much as possible. Um, this is obviously a fairly old trick, but it, feel, it, it made it feel like it was homemade, that it was handmade. It wasn't that it was some third party coming in and putting another story that was going to uplift everybody and didn't really speak to the people on the ground floor. It felt raw, it felt real, and it was coming from the people who were being affected. And sometimes that's powerful because if you are alone and you feel, Brian Aldis had the quote, that an overcrowded world is the perfect place to feel lonely. If you feel like you are alone in a crowd, there's no real way that you can go out and reach to people because everybody seems to have it together. By sharing those stories and by allowing students to create their own stories, there was this idea that, no, you're not alone. We're all in this together. We all struggle together. And we all you know, find you know, victories together. And just because you feel alone doesn't mean that you are alone. And if people could recognize those people on campus, it created that you know, constant feedback with the touch point between people. Oh, I know that person. I know that story. The first point about the analysis process, this was m months long. Uh, where we went and we interviewed uh, dozens of staff and faculty, uh, dozens of um, students. Curtin's a, uh, an enormous university, excuse me, and a lot of uh, a large part of their campus is online. So we were able to collect a lot of data with engagement, but a lot of it also came from collecting people's micro narratives, asking them to tell us stories about their experiences with uh, Curtin, with the university itself. And some people had some very good stories, and some people had some very negative stories. And what we were able to do is, utilizing um, a proprietary method, we were able to link data to these narratives. What do these, what do these narratives actually say? And we'd ask people to tell us, you know, what, what do these narratives say about it? Is this about you as a person, you as a member of a community, you as a person of a college? And they would plot, we would plot these points, and we would wound up with you know, a lot of stories that we were placed uh, onto this grid, this map, and we were able to see entrenched attitudes, attitudes that, was gonna, that were going to be very, very hard to change just because everybody felt that way. But we were also able to find uh, niche attitudes and attitudes where there were emerging patterns, where things hadn't quite coalesced yet. And if they were dangerous, we were able to go in and shift those attitudes or speak to that if they were positive to be able to draw more people organically to those points and use those stories as potential uh, media micro-narrative points. Does that answer your question? Cool. Question here? Yeah, I was wondering if you have any like ideas or thoughts, if you have a new innovative educational idea mm -hmm. about how to market to, you know, this very blocked up, you know, blocked up educational realm. And uh, if there's anything you can say about where you can start and what you can do. Yeah. So the, the big shift that we're seeing in education is that the old model of education is that there are scholars and professors and the institution which has the knowledge and the students are coming in and they must supplicate themselves to the institution to learn this model. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You want people to be able to go through these challenges and learn these skills and then look back with their diploma and recognize I am a part of a privileged elite that has gotten this diploma and has surmounted these obstacles. The diploma becomes Excalibur. It is something that allows you to go out into the world and you know, do what needs to be done to change the world, reach your goals, you know, start a family, everything that you know, an individual might want. Um, but as we are seeing more and more, we call them pluralists, the generation beneath millennials, enter into college, enter into high school, they are used to their media speaking back to them, validating their participation, and individualizing their content. And so what we are beginning to see with universities is not just individualizing content for students, not just saying, well, if you want this elective, you can take this elective, but finding ways for students to get what they want out of individualized courses and individualized connections with professors so that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. There's more towards marketing, towards finding ways to be the best you that you can be that go beyond the teacher-student relationship and more the peer-to-peer -peer relationship. That we're seeing students begin to teach other students, uh, professors set up 
um, areas where students can go and teach professors how to utilize um, you know, social media platforms that um, that older professors or professors who did not uh, staff who, who did not grow up with it don't understand. It creates this mechanism where it truly is a community of coming together in education. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're beginning to see that moment, and also online content and online learning tools uh, are becoming more and more prevalent. Some are better than others, but there's this idea that you can engage from across the planet and learn a little bit, and that creates this idea of the campus as the aspirational place to go to. Uh, that is the, it is the Camelot, the shining beacon on the hill that reflects, and then you can, if you have to take two years of community college and then transfer, that's no longer seen as a negative. Uh, whereas it was before, where you wanted to have the full four-year um, experience. Now it's okay, you can take two years of electives and coursework and hard work and then transfer with those credits to this major university where you've already taken some of these online courses. I've reached it, I've reached this goal, and I'm becoming one with the community, and I feel at one with the community because they've reached out to me and made me feel special. Does that answer your question? Just one other point. Sure, sure. Early, Mm -hmm. Yes. Early childhood is, um, is a little trickier because not only do you have to create a touch point with the parents, um, but with the children as well. Um, when we've looked at pedagogy with young children, ch young children tend to already understand instinctually the attitudes of play and the, and the, the structure of engaging um, in a way that is both learning and fun at the same time. Uh, we we've, we've found that when, from our limited research, we're mostly focused on high school and college aged students, but even from a young age when students find that they're having fun and they've, they're feeling like they're part of a story that's being built up together um, by a classroom and they're not learning things by rote, that they're more engaged with, uh, the, the stu with the teacher and with the, the course material. Uh, as, a, as to reaching out from schools to potential parents, I haven't done enough uh, research into that to uh, to make a comment on that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hi there. Um, I see that you guys have been around since 2000. Yes. And uh, I was just wondering what are the sort of holes that you saw early on that needed to be filled um, by a company such as yours or by people who are engaged in transmedia? Uh, the, the biggest the biggest shift that has come for our company is that when we first started our budgets were paid for by marketing and branding, and now they're paid for by creative. Uh, the, when we first started out, it was this idea that transmedia is a marketing campaign, and it's doing a job. It's a way to market to people and get them to buy the marketing. Um, you, and that, that kind of still holds true to a, to a degree, per se. If you go out and you buy the comic books of Star Wars, you're much more likely to be a person who'll go and see the midnight screening of Star Wars because you're so engaged with the, the story. But at the same time, we found that there were these holes where people were only thinking in terms of selling content, only in terms of creating a monetizable uh, structure to engage audiences. And once we began, and me, us, and not just us, but Campfire and, and many other transmedia companies, um, began to show people, no, it's not just selling content, it's engaging people in a storyline and a story world that they want to participate in, uh, that's when things began to get uh, better, where we began to find holes where uh, that hadn't been filled because maybe the messaging was off. Um, we, we found that aspirational messages, even in horror stories, uh, it just came out, made 51 million dollars in its opening um, day. Uh, the story of it is how you know it's just a story of childhood. You start off innocent. There are these horrors that come and are visited upon you. And through this process of self-actualization, you realize that the world is not the innocent world you knew, but nor is it so scary that you can't you know, achieve something. That's an aspirational story, even though it's told in a horror setting. So there was the shift, as we're seeing now among horror, shifting away from torture porn and shifting more towards this idea that, yes, we, there are terrible stories out there and there are terrible things that happen, but if you know, individuals or communities or whatever the message is, we can do something about that. First, I wanted to say thanks. This is, for me, a really um, insightful way to look at storytelling. I 
often haven't thought about it in terms of a Kickstarter is telling a story and engaging an audience or a football team is that um, I work on the communications team at a more traditional kind of corporate role at a financial services company. Um, and I know you mentioned at the beginning, having done work for Microsoft and, and some other brands, I'm curious if you have any um, great examples of brands that are maybe have less kind of sexy products or services, services that people don't really have an affinity for or engage with on a daily basis that are creating stories and engaging their audience in a way like this. And not to put you, it's okay, we can no, talk no, later. No, 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 I'm, I'm just thinking of the appropriate example. Um, a big thing that we teach to clients is the concept of safely subversive. This idea that subversive attitude, subversive storytelling, things that are, you know, that naturally go against the grain are intriguing to audiences because you expect a monolithic corporation to only have like, you know, we're safe, we're dependable, you're going to come and get the content. Um, and if they are able to create that kind of safety mechanism, then it allows audiences and creators for a product and marketing to create more fun ways to engage the audience. Um, other times, it's not necessarily about playing up the fun as it is reminding the audience why they chose to participate with that product in the first place. So an example might be Jaguar, which we did some consultancy with. Jaguar is a, uh, is a premium car brand. And as the economy in the United States and the rest of the world becomes increasingly stratified, you have a lot you have fewer people who are rich, but they have a lot of wealth. You have more people who are lower middle class the middle ground, the middle premium brands of cars are beginning to feel the squeeze. Because if you have money, you're going to buy a Porsche or a Ferrari. And if you don't have the money, you're going to buy a Kia. So what happens to a Jaguar, uh, the, the base model, which is $65,000? It's not seen as sexy anymore. It's not seen as the kind of car you aspire to. When we consulted with them, we found that there was one brand of car that their cars were slowly declining. One brand of car was plateauing and going up. And we looked at the marketing campaign for that car, and I can't remember the specific make, uh, the model. Um, but what we discovered from that was that the way that the marketing worked was that the marketing touch point was done after the, the buy. If you're going into a Jaguar dealership, you're pretty sure you're going to buy a Jaguar. You don't walk in just to look at the cars. You're going in because you want to buy the car. The problem is then, after you buy the car, a week later, you realize you've just spent $72,000 on a car that has about the same performance as a car that you could have spent 40 grand on. Uh, you overspent and you don't, have the, you don't have the sexy quality like you would for Ferrari or Porsche. What this campaign did was it created touch points that were five or six miles away from the dealership so that when you were driving away from the dealership, it was a reminder, you bought this car, you made the right deal, you made the right decision. It built up this brand identity that I, yes, I am a Jaguar owner. I am proud of this brand. Audi did the same thing when in the mid 2000s when they began to shift their brand. Um, they, they began to pit themselves against higher end luxury cars. And the idea was like, it, you're, it's proud. You're proud to be an Audi owner. You're proud to have this stoic, dependable, and maybe not sexy, but powerful brand that you get to engage with on a regular basis. Not everything can be sexy. But there are certain brands that people love um, because they feel right. People who buy Chryslers and Fords and they have for generations because it's not the coolest car, but it's the car that their grandfather owned and their father owned and their mother owned and their aunt owned and they are a Ford family and it makes them feel proud to be a part of that story. Other questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oops. I want to thank everybody again for coming. Thank you, Steele. This is wonderful. <laughs> I'll, let's give Steele a round of applause. This is great. Thank you, everybody. Um, again, for those of you who uh, are new, 
uh, to our events, uh, if this is your first time or your second time, uh, please feel free to, um, to follow us on Twitter. We're at StoryForwardNYC. Uh, check out our Facebook group, and we're also on Meetup and StoryForwardNYC. Um, also, we're looking for content. So if you have an idea for a workshop, a lecture, a panel, if you have a blog that you think would be you know, relevant to our audience of storytellers, if you have a show coming up, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can email us at um, info at storyforward.org. Um, and also, you know, just reach out to us anytime you want. Um, we are here. We love storytellers and we love storytelling. Um, thank you again for coming out. And um, if we'll be here for a few minutes if you want to chat. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>